Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here in Las Vegas. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. Uh, we are here for EMC World 2015. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante, their next guest. CUBE alumni, Pat Gelsinger, CEO of VMware, part of the Federation, up on stage today. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Hey John, Dave, always yeah. a pleasure to be with you guys. Um, really the power of the Federation, Dave was just talking before we came on live, is that really working out. We interviewed you six years ago when you were at EMC. Now Paul's at Pivotal, things are humming along, great Q1 performance you guys had. Uh, Federation's balancing itself out. I mean, you feel good about it, and what should customers know about the Federation now as the hybrid cloud becomes the destination? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a way station or a rest stop. No halfway house. A halfway yeah. house. <laughs> um, um, public cloud is clear, there's some things there. Yeah, okay, great. But enterprise, clearly embracing hybrid cloud. Yeah. You predicted yeah. that. Um, yeah. But some things, OpenStack, mm -hmm. Docker, application environments, networking innovation, all kind of happening. Give us the update, are you happy with the Federation and what innovations are you focused on right now? Yeah, you know, uh, of course, you know, the Federation is by design architected so that it offers choice, right? So, you know, we're off working with our independent ecosystem players, but fundamentally we're first the best with each other. And customers are buying into that. Uh, we see big wins that we're able to accomplish together, and we're delivering some clear solutions. And one I highlighted in my keynote today was the enterprise hybrid cloud, right? Which definitely is the best of the best being integrated together. And uh, with that integration, customers say, and you know, it's one of my imperatives, right? You know, IT shouldn't be looking down at infrastructure; it needs to be looking up at applications. And you know, we're integrating those components together, right? That's the whole idea of the enterprise hybrid cloud. So it becomes this platform that enables IT to yeah. spend more of their energy in digitization of the business and creating new applications. Yeah. And Dave and I well. always talk about the, the metaphors from the 90s, you know, interoperability, multi-vendor, but still lock-in is what the goal of her, for a for-profit business is to have a competitive strategy, competitive sure. advantage, mm -hmm. which is quasi-lock-in. Lock-in could be competitive advantage, but with choice, is the quote competitive differentiator or <laughs> advantage, AKA lock-in, about choice, you guys are saying, you're essentially saying lock-in means don't have, you don't have a choice, but still you have to have a competitive advantage to be a sustainable business. Yeah. You know, it is, it, always, it is always this sort of yin and yang, right, of you know, how much am I buying integrated? Uh, you know, I, I'd say most IT shops are trying to diminish their number of vendors. It's not like they want to get to one. You know, they don't want to go back to the IBM mainframe where it is all locked in top to bottom and a margin structure that, you know, is favorable in only one direction. You know, but you know, the industry now, these interfaces are pretty well established. You know, the VM, the operating system, you know, the hardware, you know, they're pretty well established. And boy, you know, as long as you're obeying those industry accepted interfaces that I know that I really have choice over time if I need it, you know, let me narrow my vendor space to make my life simpler, right? You guys do the manufacturing, I'm going to make sure I've kept control of the architecture. Right, I'm not going to outsource my brains, I'm not going to outsource my architecture, but as long as you obey this architectural template, you know, you take care of doing the integration for me, and that frees me up to invest in other places. So in February, you guys had a big month, a lot of announcements, V, v Cloud, VSphere, I, I mean, 28 <laughs> days of you know, craziness. Yeah. Um, and then you had the, the, na <laughs> you had the native app announcement. Yeah. So this native mm -hmm. operating environment for developers is yes. key, but you have the end user computing with Sanjay's team, and and you have a lot of stuff going on under the covers, down below in the infrastructure. What is your take on that? I mean, I mean, I, I think that's you're kind of eyeing it. What's what's the pattern of change that you see that you're harnessing in at the lower levels to enable a DevOps-friendly, easy-to-use, programmable infrastructure? Yeah, and it's very much you know build enough flexibility at the infrastructure layer so that we can go to any IT or any developer and saying we got it. Right, you know, what you need, right, our infrastructure is accommodating that requirement. You know, we've had big Hadoop wins, 
you know, lots of people said, hey, I need to do Hadoop physical. You know, with big data extensions and the optimizations that we put into vSphere 6, you know, run, it, uh, run Hadoop virtual. And we've had a number of big wins uh, recently where people have said, boy, you know, why am I standing up a unique, you know, a dedicated hardware infrastructure? I'll just run it virtual. You know, similarly with the cloud native announcement, you know, we're building enough optimization for containers, the management, the NSX integration, just run it on top of the infrastructure you've already built. And you know, the example I gave in the keynote this morning for uh, VMware integrated OpenStack, yeah, you know, it was just perfect, right? I get this mail, you know, they spun up 300 OpenStack VMs in 30 uh, in three minutes, you know, and they were just thrilled with how rapidly they were able to say yes to their internal developers for some key, some key web application environments that they're trying to stand up. And it all is built on the same stuff, the same vSphere, the same NSX, the same management tools, with more and more flexibility on top of it, and that is powerful. One cloud, any app, any device. You got it, Great. man. I, I'm going to sign got you it. up for my marketing okay, department. So, this but, is good. But the one cloud thing, it sounds yeah. like it sounds very Amazonish. You don't mean like only one cloud. You mean something that feels like one cloud. Can you clarify that? Yeah, and we really, you know, are positioning that there's three different models for cloud. Your private cloud, a managed cloud, a public cloud. And it really is saying it is a common architecture across that, that you literally have the choice, Mr. IT customer, where you want to run your workload. You can run it internally. We're turning your internal data center into an automated cloud environment you could outsource that environment to somebody else, your managed hosting provider, or you could consume it as a true public cloud environment. And we are going to deliver that capability that it is one cloud that your applications don't care. And we've called it the inside out and the outside in use cases. You know, if I'm going to an Amazon cloud, guess what, right? I've, I've deprecated my internal environment, right? And I've moved it and I can't bring it back easily. Right here, we're finding customers are saying, oh, you know, I want to be able to do test and dev externally, deploy internally. A number of healthcare customers really favor that model. You know, get the test and dev in the cloud, you know, it makes it easier for them, they don't have to worry about it, but the deployment's going to be internally, right, because of HIPAA regulation or just customer anxiety, you know, it's going to be done internally. Other cases, it's, you know, go build that burst environment to go to the public cloud, right, you know, where they can take advantage of it. And some of the examples I gave this morning, uh, you know, AMC, you know, they're, you know, viewing that, hey, you know, movies that, you know, hit the holidays, boy, they peach rise and fall uh, very specifically, so they're able to take advantage of it as a burst capacity, but without deprecating their internal environment. So that's really what the hybrid cloud or the one cloud is about. Okay, and in any app, I mean, Paul, years ago, said we will run any workload, software mainframe, right, that whole thing. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Check. Yeah. Any device, now, what a change in the last two years, three years. Uh, it almost seemed like VMware just couldn't find the right formula yeah. for any device. Mm -hmm. What's changed? Well, you know, obviously uh, we made you know, two big decisions. One is that we were going to really emphasize the space. We brought in Sanjay uh, Poonin as our leader there. He's brought in key talent from the industry. And we've just revitalized the leadership team. And we made a handful of key acquisitions. Obviously, AirWatch was at the, you know, the apex of that. But it's also uh, things like cloud volumes. You know, they're just doing great. You know, it's the Amidio acquisition that we've done. You know, all of those pieces have just come into place that we're innovating. Right, we're doing inorganic uh, plays. You know, we have the leadership team now, and uh, boy, the competitors are stumbling, and we are pressing on the gas. This is a great time for us in the end user so space. You, you said uh, on uh, there's a tweet I'm reading here. I want you to explain. It says this is quote. This is what you explained. Um, IT teams still focusing on assembling piece piece parts are destined to fail. Explains Pat Gelsinger. What did you mean by that? And and what is uh, what is the takeaway from that quote? Yeah, and you know, really it's, uh, you know, and I laid out the, the four examples that I gave in my keynote this morning against that. We're software-defined data center, we're integrating those pieces. You know, you know the uh, uh, converged infrastructure and hyper-converged, we're integrating the pieces. Or VIO, we're integrating those next generation environments. And it's all about, you know, you know, making the right architectural choices and buying them at the biggest quanta possible so that your IT team is no longer managing the micro connections of this server with that switch, right, with this management tool, et cetera. That isn't where you're going to differentiate the business in the next decade. It's about freeing up IT resources so that you can be investing forward in new applications and becoming the transformative engine every business must digitize. 
and who are the smartest guys on technology in any business? It's the IT guys. But if you're down here doing plumbing, right, of a firmware upgrade on this thing, you know, you're not spending it building the next app. So it's being more strategic, IT being the strategic. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, get out of the plumbing, okay, get so into I, the So I got to ask you kind of like the Silicon Valley question because like, you know, everyone that starts a company has to be a platform. You know, tools, oh, I don't, you know, don't want to invest in a tool. Should IT and customers think about themselves as building platforms, almost like a startup, or is that the wrong notion? Do you think VMware and or your ecosystem should do that? Where is this new normal going? Is it, because you're essentially saying, okay, if you're focusing on business problems, you're essentially building solutions. Yeah, you know, the valley is so uh, wonderful, right? <laughs> you know, in, in the sense that, you know, you have hypes, you have fads, right? You have, uh, you have ecosystems and platforms. Right, and so you know, if platform is the cool word, everybody better be a platform if you're going to get funded in Silicon Valley. <laughs> you know, but to me, you know, that that puts the cart before the horse. Right, it's build a compelling application. Right, and you may generalize it to a platform uh, over time, but it's all about building that compelling use case or the compelling application, and that always has to come first. Right. Now, if you've done that well, you may be given the opportunity to create a platform for other people to build upon. Right. But if nobody cares about your application or your data, right, you know, give it up. Right. You, you may get funded by uh, some, you know, some uh, people who have, you know, uh, bad money to throw at you. But right, you have, yeah. first have to compare. And I, but IT, to your point though, is is becoming a platform, not so much getting in the weeds. Absolutely. And IT the, is about building a platform for any application that you've created more flexibility. Right, and that is the job of IT now, right, is creating an environment that allows them to future-proof their business, take all of their old apps, app, uh, data, applications, et cetera, and be able to transform them into the future of the business that they are part of. I wonder if we could talk about innovation. A lot, we've heard a lot at this conference about digitization of businesses, and you know, Ubers as an example, and Airbnb, those are the sort of new Facebooks and Googles yeah, that we all yeah. talk about. Um, I want to, so you're our number one CUBE guest. Uh, with deference to this, there's thousands and thousands of other CUBE guests we've had, <laughs> you're number one. Yeah. You're just ahead of John Cleese, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we had him on a couple weeks ago. So, <laughs> and even though you've been on a lot, uh, when, when we have an opportunity to sit down with you, I, I'd like to pick your brain on some things because you're qualified to answer these questions. And it, it goes, I want to go back to the roots of innovation in our industry, which has been Moore's Law. A lot of people say Moore's Law is 50 year anniversary. Done. They mm -hmm. say it's done. Right, Moore's Law is dead, you can find a zillion articles, and Intel has found ways, and others have found ways to yeah. you know, continue that innovation curve. So my first question is, is Moore's Law dead? And then we'll continue from there. Yeah, and you know, the, the simple answer is no. Uh, and I've been sort of giving that speech for about 25 years of my career. Uh, and uh, you know, about 30 years ago, you know, Moore's Law was declared dead. Right here, we are 30 years later, and we're still having that discussion. You know, because what's happening is you're, you're you're reaching limits of physics and chemistry, right? And then creative physicists and chemists find up new structures that allow them to advance the state a bit further, right? So you know, and you know, becomes building that uh, Moore's Law sort of always has this 10-year visibility where nobody has any frickin' idea how you're going to make it work 10 years from now, but hey, three years have advanced, and boy, you know, you still have that sort of 10-year limitation of how far you can go when solving some of those problems. The problems do get harder, right, because you're now literally down to the singular molecular level at some, but then they find new structures, they find new materials, and they continue that innovation, and like flash memory. You know, we declared the death of flash memory below 20 nanometers. Well then, clever engineers said, oh, let's stack it. Right, and we're going to continue Moore's Law without doing lateral Moore's Law, and we're going to do vertical Moore's Law. And they've actually gone super Moore's Law as a result. You know, they are innovating faster than doubling every two years as a result. So all of these clever approaches, and 3D has been one that's uh, definitely enabled that continuing evolution to go forward. So all of those who are declaring the death so of just Moore's in, Law. In, inter interject here, because I know Dave's got to follow on, but software is now the new innovation. So where do you yeah. take Moore's Law in virtualization, cloud? Yeah, yeah, and Moore's Law really is a, about that fundamental you know, Physical, hardware level, yeah. right? And it enables us to do things at the software level. Right, and we sort of live on the fumes of Moore's Law, if you could, right? Because we just assume, you know, hey, now we've moved from scale up to scale out. Moore's Law allows that scale out environment to be almost unlimited. You know, that's the magic of the cloud, 
right? If you can architect your application to be a distributed application, the compute capacity that you can apply to it is essentially infinite, right? And at diminishingly small cost. The data capacity, if you can access distributed data, is essentially infinite that you're able to now access, right, uh, and be able to operate upon. And then you throw the right algorithms uh, uh, against it in data structures, and literally, you can ask any question and get an answer. And that is really a profound shift that occurs in this era of mobile and cloud. You can access it from anywhere on your mobile device with an infinitely connected network, right, and have capacity and compute at infinite scale. Okay, so Moore's Law continues, got that. If, and you, you've taught us over the years, if you plot Moore's Law, you know, it looks like nothing happens and all of a sudden it goes exponential, but if you plot on a log you know, graph, it looks at yeah, you know, a 45 you know, degree angle. You look brilliant, right? Just, you know, just a, a linear law, law. that semi-law graph, man, you so, predict the future. Right, that's, that's right, good, so, it's, so, it's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's my secret yeah, whole life. I just wow. use semi-law, everybody else is using linear, I'm using semi-log, I'm smart. <laughs> so, a lot of discussion around where's innovation come from in the future beyond you know, Moore's Law, and can we even bend that curve further? And people are talking about combinations of technology. You look at things like Waze. Mm -hmm. What is Waze? You know, it's software, it's geolocation, it's mobile, it's social, and they yeah. build a multi, you know, billion dollar right. business model uh, out of it. So, so where does that innovation come from on top of Moore's Law, and what does the infrastructure look like that supports that innovation to bring us to this digital economy? Yeah, you know, I sort of think about it, you know, you have this underlayment of the hardware layer, right, uh, that's occurring, and on top of it, we have the mobile cloud infrastructure that I call it. Right, you know, mobile is ubiquitous access, and IoT is just pushing that ubiquitous access, you know, further and further into machine to machine as opposed to man to machine environments. You know, and cloud is giving us a ubiquitous infrastructure, and on top of that, you put right increasing applications uh, that sit on top of it that are increasingly distributed software uh, environments, increasingly data and analytic environments on top of that environment, and things like social, et cetera. You know, really are just building on that mobile cloud infrastructure structure, all of which relies on Moore's Law. So that's sort of the layering of the cake as I see it. Now what happens is, right, you know, as that occurs, you know, this huge data environments, the huge compute environments that we have, this ubiquitous either deployment or access of data that emerges, you know, and this is where Paul gets so excited, you know, Paul Moritz gets excited, that we really now can combine, right, you know, real-time data with analytic repositories and catch things in the act. Right, where literally you can now start envisioning applications that literally we can catch you in the act. Change an outcome. Yeah, right, you know, we're literally, you know, tomorrow morning, right, you know, uh, we wake up and it says, you know, you had a heart aneurysm last night. I've scheduled you to go to the doctor, right, this morning, and because of that heart palpitation that you had, you know, we've already uploaded all of your data, all of your biometrics, you know, I rerouted you, I got you up early, right, Starbucks is waiting with your coffee on the way, everything yeah. is taken care of. You know, these are things where, you know, it's going to change the way we do medicine, it's going to change the way that we do transportation. You know, I, uh, Scott McNeely is my neighbor, and he said, well, think about the impact of you know self-driving cars you know your car is like two or three percent utilized yeah right right what happens when you can make your car 80 percent utilized <laughs> right you know as well you know VMware like, for cars yeah you know, I mean just boom you know all of a sudden you know the car when it's not uh, you know sitting you know idle there right you know I'm gonna have my uber application and when it's not being used by me it's going to be out doing uh, delivery for uh, you know my packages or whatever Door else dash. it might be you know, it just changes everything about and every industry, right? You know, whether it's healthcare, whether it's transportation, uh, whether it's uh, you know any other uh, social advertising, etc. They will all be transformed by this digitization that occurs. So, so, so you know, we're just at the beginning. Baby. Yeah. So m m <laughs> machines have always placed humans, you know, historically a lot of physical labor, and now it's entering the cognitive level. Do you worry? Maybe this gets a little too political, but you wrote a book, so I can ask you. <laughs> so, the the median income in the United States, anyway, has dropped since 1999 from like 55,000 down to I don't know, 51,000 or something like that. So the, the 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 middle is getting hollowed out. You talk about self-driving cars. Uh, you know, machines are essentially taking over all these human tasks. Do you worry that, for instance, Facebook and Instagram have many more pictures under their roof than than Kodak ever had, but they employ a lot less people? What's mm -hmm. happening in the economy? 
how can we continue to drive the economy forward from a you know middle class employment standpoint? Do you worry about that? Uh, you know, I think uh, I think everybody should worry about that. You know, it's always how do we continue to improve the quality of life for the nation. Uh, for it. And, you know, I fundamentally believe that all, every aspect of that is it, it always is going to be associated with some form of education, right? You know, what makes for great economies, right? You know, the rule of law, right? You know, that people know, right? You know, that they can invest in things, right? Uh, and uh, education, right? You apply those two things in a, in a good, proper environment, right? You know, good things happen. So, you know, to me, that is both the greatest opportunity and the greatest concern yeah. uh, of our nation. That's, uh, you know, K through 12, we suck, right? You know, and all of our uh, graduates and, uh, you know, uh, uh, education systems are the finest in the world. You know, we need better raw yeah. product, right, uh, uh, coming into it. And so that, that I think, becomes, you know, the And after we educate issue. them, we should keep them here. I presume Absolutely. you're a fan of that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, as well. and, we should, and we should let every foreign immigrant, right, you know, who has a, a master's level education immigrate. Yeah, right. yeah, that's the H1B you know, please, nightmare. Please, you know, the rest yeah. of the world, don't send me your best and brightest people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, how bizarre, right? Please, come on in, right? If you're, yeah. you know, because you're hungry, you're smart, you're aggressive, come and join us as we're building the greatest nation yeah. on earth. And there's so much to do. You mentioned the scenario of the way work and life could be. Mm -hmm. The possibilities are being redefined, you know, redefined in the next generation. Um, so I got to kind of bring it back to your vision, right? So that's a great vision, we love it. Preferred future, looks great. But VMware, VMware has an installed base and you're inventing the future, trying to put the roadmap together, identify the puzzle pieces for the future. You have to balance that cannibalization question of, okay, you got to really eat your own before someone else does. And I asked you last year, are you, are you on the offense or defense? And of course we knew <laughs> you're going to be offensive. So we know you're offensive to create the future. But you have a lot of installed business. Sure, sure. What's, what's it like for you and how do you balance that innovation mindset of, you know, run fast, take new territory? Mm -hmm. Because if you hold down to your sacred cows and customers, you could go slower, miss an opportunity. So to go move fast, to take new territory to in position to VMware. Yeah. How do you balance that, you know? And, you know, we, we really are viewing, you know, the core hypervisor, right? You know, the area that you'd say, boy, that's mature, you guys did that a decade ago. But we view that as this powerful point that we now use to bring other innovations to market from. And hey, you know, we are not done innovating in the core hypervisor. I mean, look at vSphere 6, right? We did HA, we did fault tolerance. You know, these are pretty big breakthroughs, right? You know, long distance vMotion. I mean, this is cool stuff, but when you're 80% penetrated, you know, okay, there's not a whole lot more market. But then the really cool things that we do are, boy, we're grabbing the IO stack with vVol and vSAN and doing entirely new things in storage. We're grabbing the packet flow with distributed firewalls and load balancing and routing, you know, for the networking footprint. We're finding new ways to do management of workloads and being able to innovate new security models, et cetera, associated with it. That's all based on that core hypervisor. So it really is, you know, keep innovating in the core, right? You know, and I drive those guys like crazy. And, you know, if somebody says that the hypervisor is a C word, right, associated with it, I say your blood should boil. <laughs> but you are a foundation for us to innovate in all of these new areas. So I'm driving them to find ways to grab the networking guys, the management guys, the cloud guys, the uh, storage guys, to find new ways to take that footprint, yeah. right, and bring value into all these other domains. Yeah, the, the other dimension that, that is the chess game of the chessboard of the competitive landscape you're navigating as well. So, you know, we're looking at Azure doing pretty well with their install base. They're obviously aggressively cannibalizing their own to bring their cloud business. Um, you guys are, I think, a great install base like in the enterprise, like Microsoft. Um, your relationship with Google was kind of, not I want to say Barney deal, but I, you know, it, was a, it was a partnership. It was, it was, it was, it was, no, I mean, it's not a technology deal per se, yeah. just to clarify, you know. Okay. That, I mean, but, but there's some technology with their cloud. Yeah. And Azure is beating Google, but Google has peering, Google has a lot of developers. Oh yeah, so, they got scale. And scale, so uh, maybe I'm just saying Google, VMware, I mean, I was watching HBO Game of Thrones on my laptop because I wasn't with my wife watching it, I was streaming it, I had my Netflix Mad Men watching, uh -huh. so I'm watching the peering relationships, yeah. service providers, so there's some still levers out there. Oh yeah. You share and, the... Yeah, and you know, we, we uh, uh, there are a few people that we compete with there are numerous people that we partner with, 
and that that to us is the fundamental position that we are you know going to pursue as we go forward because we are you know partnering you know we announced our Telstra partnership our SoftBank uh, uh, partnership the Google partnership we absolutely view the service providers as a partner for us and they invest heavily in networks and data centers you know Google has the biggest network the biggest data center footprint in the world absolutely they have a lot they of dark no, fiber too yeah uh, absolutely i mean that communications network boy you know we're you know we're excited about that and they have no particular presence in the enterprise. Oh, yeah. that's our hard I know. So, you know, we're finding ways to come together. You see that you know, as a great partnership. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Google's not known for a strong DNA of partnering, and we're exploring, can we bring that together? And we did the uh, Chromebook, right, we did the Android partnership, and the Google Compute partnership. So, you know, we've announced three partnerships with them, and, you know, I'm yeah. reasonably well, optimistic. Well, and the TAM is there, you've laid it out, you know, very succinctly, you guys <laughs> did a great job at that. Um, and and it sounds like, you you said, you can't use the C word uh, with the hypervisor, so your challenge then is to move faster than the open source community, but still connect to the open Absolutely. source community. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I always ask you, what gives you confidence that you can stay ahead of the pace of open source and still preserve that opportunity for VMware? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. The open source community is not necessarily the fastest moving, right? Because they have this sort of consensual process that they're going through. And you know, look at the innovations that we put into vSphere 6 versus where KVM is. Mm -hmm not even close, right? You know, we have a huge leadership position, we're investing, we're focused, we have the best and the brightest in that space. But there's this consensual process that goes on in the open source community that allows innovations to occur in rafts of communities that you never even dream of. Like open right? R&D almost, right? Yeah, right, so. in that sense. And, you know, uh, Bill Joy from Sun, he always had the saying, right, there, there are more smart people outside of our company than are inside. So the real question isn't whether you know one is innovating more rapidly than the other, it's when you see innovation occurring in a different domain, can you bring it into the environment, leverage it against the, you know, the interesting aspects that you are the fundamental leader or the differentiated offering in? That, that's why to me the VIO strategy is so good for us. Because I'm saying, boy, you know, these upper level APIs, lots of stuff is going on there. Are we highly differentiated? You know, hey, we got the Vim APIs, they're well accepted in the industry, but there's a whole nother yeah. bubbling cauldron of innovation. So we say just grab it, put it on top of our stuff, and you know, now we've extended the utility of our core differentiated technology with a whole set of innovations that we didn't do. Right, I didn't have to pay for those. I just grabbed them, add yeah. them to our product, and I'm delivering a value proposition to customers that's working. So you're not competing with open source, you're competing with those who are trying to leverage open source just yep. as you are, and that's the devil that you know. Yep, yep, and I'm going to, you know, and that, that was a fundamental shift, and our cloud native announcement really caught people by surprise. Wow, you're delivering some pretty core innovations into the open source community. Yeah. That's the best lightweight Linux yeah. that we've seen yet. You know, at less well, than five years. Well, is a great example. Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, you know, we're absolutely stuff. embracing these things. You know, uh, the uh, Lightwave announcement. This is cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you know, talked about uh, Lightwave, Photon, Lattice. Yeah, and that's yeah, these, more Lattice these are good. Is more pivotal, these are good. Uh, you know, these are good innovations that are occurring. So we're participating as proper okay. citizens of that community benefiting from it and adding our value proposition to it. Okay, so I've got to ask you two questions, um, two different kinds of questions. One is technology, always been, you've always been uh, from the school of enabling technologies, letting people build stuff on top of something else, whether it's you know, at Intel and then through your career. What are you most excited about from an enabling technology standpoint in this really awesome time of change? And the second part of the question is, what are you most excited about from a customer standpoint? I know you talk to a lot of customers and partners. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, exciting enabling technology in the, in the industry, lever of innovation, and then customer use case environment change. Yeah, so the one you know, that, that I am most excited about, if you say, you know, VMware is doing a lot of cool things, the one I am most excited about is NSX. Period, bar none. Because it's like ESX was in 2005. Right, you know, it will be this domain of innovation that's going to continue for at least the next five and probably the next 15 years. Right, will emerge out of that uh, because you know it's like we haven't invented V motion yet. Right, you know, you know, it's you know we're refactoring what people have done over the network over the last 25 years and bringing it into the virtual platform. You know, virtual firewalls, virtual IDS and IPS, right, virtual load balancers, but we haven't created a fundamentally new function yet, right? And we're going to create those. 
right? The industry is going to create those and it will create an entirely new environment for how we think about you know, networking function in the virtual domain that's application aware and infrastructure aware. This is going to be very cool. And customer, customer or partner, innovation. Look, look at everybody. Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> with, you know, with a single exception, everybody else in the industry is embracing this full on, right? And we're seeing them say, how can I innovate with NSX and that layer of network virtualization? Pat Gelsinger here inside the Cube. I know you got a hard stop. Um, your take on EMC World, last word. What's the vibe? I mean, you've been to all the shows past six years. Six years of EMC World. Federation. You know, the energy pumping? is high. I uh, hear, you know, a lot of, you know, people are really pleased with the announcements that have been made, you know, whether it's the Beast, whether it's VX Rack, you know, the things that are coming forward here. So people are saying, yeah, you know, this is still delivering value. People are excited about the Federation, the unique value that we bring of the companies uh, coming together. And uh, we're far from done yeah. of the core yeah. things that are done at the hardware level, DSSD, Bill Moore, team, you know, Disruption. good things happening. Do you Disruption. miss being up on stage, things blowing up? Uh, you know, hey, you know, uh, yesterday I was on the show floor, Dave, and they stood me up in front of the big all-flash array that we're running in the thing, right? And a bunch of those Intel guys who were showing the all-flash array used to work for me. And it's something like, you know, there's just something wonderful about being able to touch yeah. hardware. I just like the software stuff, you know, yeah. the yeah. hardware, yeah. I love big, it. Big box, power yeah. god box. Yeah. Pat Gelsinger, great disruption and innovation happening at the same time, really a unique, industry situation. Thanks for sharing your insight with us. Like always, Again, love you guys. Pleasure. You're awesome. Pat Gelsinger here inside theCUBE sharing his insights, predictions, philosophies, and of course, the update on VMware with theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.